This is Pete Fletcher. Join us for a conversation with writer, producer, and author Mark Altman. I have a very popular Star Trek podcast I co-host called Inglorious Trek Experts. Occasionally we'll dip into Star Wars. Uh, we got such pushback. This is a Star Trek podcast, not a Star Wars podcast. You're listening to Around the Galaxy. Welcome to episode number 120 of Around the Galaxy, the Star Wars fan talk show. I am your host, Pete Fletzer. Thank you so much for joining us. If this is your first visit with Around the Galaxy, please hit that subscribe button. Make sure to like it, save it, send it to a friend, call somebody, follow us on Twitter, follow us on Facebook, follow us on TikTok, follow us on... Yeah, I said TikTok. Yeah, I did. I don't know what I'm doing there, but I did say TikTok. You can follow us on all our social media channels at ATGCast. We made it really easy for you. And also, hey, check out our website, ATGCast.com. Not only will you find all of our older episodes there, you'll find more information about me, your host, and you'll also be able to get our merch as well as consider becoming a patron of Around the Galaxy for as little as $3 a month. Every single supporter of Around the Galaxy through our Patreon program gets a weekly link to the live recording of every episode of the podcast. We do a live video stream with our guests and we leave the chat open. And often you'll hear us reference comments from the chat. So you will actually become a part of Around the Galaxy and and we would love to have you join us. Well, this week we have author Mark A. Altman as our guest. He is a writer, producer, and actor. He was one of two writers on the romantic comedy called Free Enterprise. He's written many behind-the-scenes books and historical records about the Star Trek franchise, as well as writing for both the Malibu and DC Star Trek comics. So what does a Star Trek guy have to do with Star Wars? Well, first of all, he was the editor of Sci-Fi Universe. This was an edgy genre magazine back in the late 90s. And he's got a brand new book coming out in mid-July called Secrets of the Force, the complete, uncensored, unauthorized oral history of Star Wars. And like I said, that drops in just a couple weeks. You're going to find the link to pre-order that in the notes section of this episode. So one more thing, you're going to start hearing in the Around the Galaxy podcast feed. Every week, we're going to do a brand new show called Disturbances in the Force. And it's about a five minute sort of news digest of all the news, rumors and the latest happenings in the Star Wars universe. And so that's probably going to drop on Saturdays. Give us five minutes of your time and we'll give you all the Star Wars news that happened in the previous week. Well, without further ado, I am very excited to bring you our conversation with Mark A. Altman. Mark, let's settle it. Star Trek or Star Wars, what's better? Well, you know, <laughs> that's, that's kind of like saying who's your favorite James Bond. Is it Sean Connery or, you know, right. Roger Moore or you know, George Lazenby or, you know, Daniel Craig? You know, and, and I always say it's, uh, you know, growing up in New York, it's like Mets or Yankees or, you know, it's just, it, 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 I, you know, to me, it's like I love them both. Yeah. I love both my children equally. So, um, <laughs> You know, it's it's never been like, oh, which is better? And, you know, it depends on your mood, too. If you're looking yeah. for a cerebral morality tale, then chances are it's Star Trek. If you're looking for some kick-ass, you know, action and, and, and uh, deep with deep philosophical underpinnings, then it's Star Wars, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Well, and both franchises have now been around for multiple generations. It's hard to believe. Where do you think they're most alike and where do you think they're most different as franchises go? Oh, that's you know, like that's an interesting question. Look, I I, I think uh, one of the people who said it best. That there was the you know I was there for that tenth anniversary convention of Star Wars uh, in Los Angeles. It was my first time I ever came out to Los Angeles, and you know where George Lucas and Gene Roddenberry met for the first, mm. I think, last time. And you know they both talked about how they admired each other's galaxies, but they're very they're very very different, you know. Yeah. Um, and I think that. Uh, uh, you know, certainly with, with you know Star Wars, uh, you know the reason that we love Star Trek and we love Star Wars is there's such a rich tapestry to mm-hmm. the canon. You know, I think one of the great things, you know, a lot of people say, oh, maybe they didn't like the prequels, but that Clone Wars elevated them in their mind because Clone Wars is so good. So you know, the universe of Star Wars is so rich. All these civilizations, all these races. You know, certainly legend uh, expanded. The legends expanded on it. And but, you know, what they've done, you know, in the last 10 years in terms of television, in terms of animation, in terms of, you know, Mandalorian and stuff is just enriched the universe. And I think what Star Trek gets at, is at its best 
it's when it's it, it also is plumbing that mythology of you know the the different galactic races and the planets and it and it respects its canon and doesn't mm. try and reinvent you know re, reinvent itself yeah yeah it's true and i think that's been one of the interesting challenges for star wars and star trek had to fight it for many years because they were sort of you know with uh, they you know they had novels that just went off in all kinds of different directions back back before uh canon was was really a a, a thing in in that universe but do you still see you know i i having been a star wars fan my whole life a bit of a star trek fan but not as 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 deeply but there was kind of a competition between star wars and star trek fans do you see that still or do you think it's it's kind of uh both fandoms have kind of grown in their own directions oh, or yeah, you know it, it, there is i mean it's ridiculous because i have a very popular star trek podcast i co-host called inglorious trek experts mm -hmm. and you know occasionally we'll dip into star wars like we had henry gilroy on to talk about clone wars basically because you know i freaking love clone wars so you know i find <laughs> any excuses to to do that stuff and you know uh, we got such pushback this is a star trek podcast not a star <laughs> wars podcast and, you know it, it, it's uh and it's really annoying because I feel like, you know, I try to like deal with whatever I find interesting, whatever I like, you know, and like we did an episode with Aaron Gray on Buck Rogers and I found the thinnest sliver uh, of Star Trek to hang it on that she auditioned <laughs> once for Janeway and Voyager. Okay. So, um, you know, it, it's amazing to me when people do that. And even like, you know, on the Twitter feed uh, or something for Inglorious Trexperts or my personal thing. It's like, you know, we mentioned something about Star Wars and it's like, hey, you're, but you're a Star Trek. It's like, get mm -hmm. out. You know, it's like, talk about, you know, stay in your lane kind of nonsense. It's like yeah. ridiculous. You know, it's what we said at the beginning. I love them both for different reasons, mm -hmm. that, you know, and, and, you know, I've been a Star Wars fan since 77, you know, I mean, I, I, I talk about it in the introduction to the book. I mean, I uh, had first heard about it. I think it was in Starlog number seven uh mm -hmm. or maybe before that but i remember i'll never forget you know when starlog had a star wars on the cover and it consisted of a one-page article with two ralph Macquarie paintings <laughs> so, like that was their coverage and uh i was so frustrated because i was desperate for anything about star wars and i kept telling my parents it's like i i, I have to see this movie i mean this movie is going to be amazing it looks incredible i you know i i have to see it and um you know that back then wide releases weren't really that wide it wasn't that you know it was only playing a couple of theaters i don't even think it was playing in brooklyn yet so one day you know my parents say oh we're going out to new jersey it was like might as well have been uh you know saskatchewan and uh we're we're uh, we're driving we're driving we passed the paramus park mall and there on the marquee was the other side of midnight and star wars i'm like look star wars we gotta go say, oh we're not going to that and and we go and we go to this farrell's ice cream parlor and we had a great time, great ice cream and everything. And we start driving back. And suddenly I noticed, wait a second, we're pulling into the parking lot. And I'm like, what's going on? They said, what do you think? We're, we're out here. We didn't go here, come out for ice cream. We're going to see Star Wars. <laughs> I'm like, oh, I was like the happiest day of my life. So, and I mean, I, 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 I say, and this is true in the book, I could literally show you where the parking spot was, you know, 40 <laughs> years later where we parked. And, and um, you know, and then we went in. I had the same experience everybody did. You know, the chance of uh, going over Tatooine, you're thinking this is the coolest ship ever. And then all of a sudden, the Star Destroyer, it's like, oh, my God, this is the coolest thing ever. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so, I mean, so I'm a huge Star Wars fan. And, and um, you know, that's why this whole idea of, oh, Star Trek versus Star Wars, I think there's a false equivalency. They're both great in completely different ways. I mean, it used to be, you say, Star Trek was essentially a TV franchise that really bumbled around with movies to the to a certain extent. Mm -hmm. It wasn't a movie franchise. It didn't work best as a movie. And then Star Wars was really a movie franchise that bumbled around on TV. But, mm -hmm. uh, you know, with the, the Endor movies, you know, the Ewok movies, and, <laughs> yeah. you know, the holiday special. But now all that's been blown up because um, obviously, well, less so for Star, Star Trek, still barely a TV. But, <laughs> um, but with, you know, Star Wars, the best Star Wars is really being done for TV now. So uh, it, it's kind of not true anymore. I have a quote here from you. I think in 1999, you said when Deep Space Nine and Next Generation were on the IR simultaneously, that was the beginning of what some would say was overkill, beating it into submission, exploiting the crown jewel. Would you say that Star Wars might be doing that right now? I mean, there's Star Wars everywhere. And as a, as a lifelong fan, I love it. But do you feel like is Star Wars sort of on that edge of potentially flooding the market? You know, I, I, there's the potential, but I, I always think there's plenty of room as long as it's good. Mm. And, you know, I think one of the problems, unfortunately, with the sequels was it was this whole notion of we want to attract a new audience. And I don't think Star Wars has been particularly good 
in terms of attracting, uh, you know, a lot of young people to the franchise the way we got excited about it. Right. I think what Star Wars has been good is keeping us around, you know, and keeping us excited about Star Wars. But, you know, even if, you know, you, you, you sort of my market research is like, I'll look on Halloween. How many mm-hmm. people are dressed up in Star Wars costumes? And when Force Awakens came, you know, there was like this kind of resurgence. But by mm-hmm. the time you get to Rise of Skywalker, there weren't that many people dressing up as Star Wars in that age bracket, you know? That's I mean, true. my son is a huge Star Wars fan. But um, I find that a lot of people he goes to school with, you know, his peers aren't, you know, he, he he's desperate to find more people, you know, who are as uh, crazed about Star Wars as he, he is. But, you know, to me, it's like you look right now and like with Mandalorian and Bad, Bad Batch, which I, I really love, but I love Men on a Mission mo- movies. So I love like right. Dirty Dozen and Magnus and Seven. So I'm a sucker for the Bad Batch. <laughs> um, but uh, I, I think that... Um, you know, there's definitely a danger. Um, you know, Star Trek's going through that. Like, how many shows? But I think it's like, how many good shows can you have? Probably right. not enough. You know, it's like, just look at Star Wars. I Marvel. There's no Marvel fatigue. You know, they do Wonder Vision, Falcon, and Snowman, uh, a Loki now, and nobody's saying there's too many Mar- uh, Marvel TV shows. They say, give me more, make my right. Marvel right. And yeah. and I think it's the same thing with Star Wars. As long as they keep delivering on the promise. You know, it, it'll help. I just think, I'm, you know, the, the, the sequels ultimately were very polarizing. And so, you know, a lot of people have a chip on their shoulder now about, about Star Wars. But some of the best Star Wars, you know, around has been done the last 10 years. You know, Rogue One is uh, phenomenal. And, mm-hmm. you know, I think that the, the TV series, you know, obviously that last season of Clone Wars was, was great. And, um, you know, so there's a lot of great Star Wars. There's no sense of, for me of like fatigue or that, you know, um, the franchise is, is faltering, you yeah. know, whereas you could make that argument with Star Trek. Yeah. Well, and it's interesting because I, as, as I said, I, I follow Star Trek, but very peripherally, very much on, on the edge, just because it's, you know, it's always been a part of, of my life in one way or another, but not, not, but it is interesting to watch Star Trek try to kind of come back into that. And to your point, it's they're, they're trying to find that, that pickup again, but I don't know. I, my sense is that, uh, these Star Trek specifically seems to come and go. And when it comes back, it comes back strong and then it goes away for a while. Then it comes back. Yeah. Uh, uh, but maybe yeah, that's, that, yeah. The biggest mistake that people make is I think comparing Star Trek to Star Wars. There's a sense, you know, even going back to when Star Trek, the motion picture was put into production, you know, Paramount was going to do a TV series of Star Trek. And they said, what? Are, and the Star Wars opens and they said, what do we have? That's like mm-hmm. Star Wars. And they say, oh, Star Trek it is star in the title, right? <laughs> but Star Trek is not Star Wars. Right. You know, so you have the first Happy Meal for McDonald's as a Star Trek Happy Meal. But, you know, it's not Star Wars. Everyone thinks mm-hmm. it's, oh, this is going to be on par with Star Wars. And the toys bomb, right? And then the second Happy Meal is Burger <laughs> King. By the time you get to Star Trek Three, it's Taco Bell. It shows you how mediocre, you know, Star Trek is not Star Wars. Star Wars is is for everyone. Right. Mm-hmm. Star Wars is a huge franchise. And, and you know, Star Trek, while stuff like Kirk, Spock and McCoy are sort of iconic and people, you know, no matter even people who don't watch the show, know who they are. They know what warp speed means. It's mm-hmm. entered the vernacular. Star Trek as a franchise is not nearly, you know, and, and I would argue this even if I was saying the Star Trek is the better franchise. Mm-hmm. Um, you can't argue it's the more successful franchise. It's not at the box office mm-hmm. and it's certainly not. Uh, in terms of uh, uh, um, and, and internationally, it's never performed that well. You know, right. it's a it's a primarily U.S. phenomena, um, more so than Star Wars, which is more of a global brand. Um, I mean, you know, just compare the success. I mean, the Star Trek the toys and merchandise have always been niche products, where right. Star Wars is, you know, the most successful IP toy line, you know, of all time. Right. Yeah, I was going to say as you were going through that that list, uh, it, my my thinking was initially that you don't see Star Trek action figures, and Star Wars is is a toy creating and collectible creating machine at at all levels. Where I feel like Star Trek is very specific in the types of things that that are available for Star Trek collectors to, well, I, to get. 
And there's a reason that basically the failure of the Star Trek toy line basically put Mego out of business, but also that every movie, it's a different to master toy licensee. Whereas Star Wars, you basically have Kenner and then Kenner gets sold to Hasbro and then Hasbro mm -hmm. does the toys until today. Whereas, you know, with Star Trek, it's always someone different because they're never successful. And whoever's <laughs> going to do it thinks, oh, we're going to be the people that make Star Trek successful because they really think it's on par with Star Wars. And it's it's not. It, the kids don't aren't into Star Trek. They've mm -hmm. never been, the, you know, uh, uh, and they don't play with the stuff as much. So it's much more a high end collectible market only for Star Trek, where people want to spend a couple of grand on an enterprise, you know, as opposed to. You know, and, and the same way that people spend hundreds of dollars on hot toys for Star Wars. Right. Um, but, you know, it's not like something where you just go, if there were still Toys R Us, it, you know, <laughs> oh, I'm going to buy a bunch of Star Trek action figures. I mean, that, that, that doesn't exist anymore. Right, right. This is Jason Fry. You're listening to Around the Galaxy. So, so tell us a, a little bit about the book, The Secrets of the Force. Secrets of the Force. Yes. Yeah, well, we... Um, you know, we've done a series of very successful uh, books, um, oral histories, and uh, starting with uh, 50 Year Mission in um, uh, for the 50th anniversary of Star Trek, and that was a two volume book. It was sold as a one volume book, and um, it was so our manuscript was so long. We told our editor, we said, you know, this needs to be two volumes. This needs hmm. to be two, uh, and and he said, I'll be the judge of that. And we sent him the manuscript. And we literally got an email that next Monday and said it's two books, which was very gratifying because right. we would have had it. And, and you know, the books were uh, hugely successful. I mean, you know, bestsellers and everything. And that was great. And that was gratifying. We put a lot of work into it. So then, you know, we did, uh, we did a Galactica book. We did a James Bond book for them, same oral history format. Um, and, and, you know, all, all of them did, did well. But um, it's funny because Star Wars was the first time they came to us and said, um, we want to see, would you be interested? Uh, or, you know, and I said, you know, Ed immediately said yes. And I, like uh, Michael Corleone and Godfather 3, keep trying to get out, but they pull me back in uh, <laughs> because I just don't have the time. You know, I'm producing a TV series. I have my show on the CW, Pandora. Um, you know, uh, we're doing this documentary in 1982, um, Greatest Geek Year Ever, which is mm -hmm. actually funding on Kickstarter right now. So I'm always got a million things going. So, the, you know, these books are very time consuming and they're a ton of work. And, you know, we got this deal right before I had to go shoot the second season of Pandora in Europe. And I was, you know, and uh, Ed, Ed was like, we got to do this. And I'm like, God, I love Star Wars. I, I hmm. And so it's like, so it was like after I thought the Bond book was going to be my last book. And I'm just like, Okay, I'll do Star Wars because it's Star Wars. And so we ended up doing the book. And, you know, we did have to, you know, we didn't have a ton of time um, to, to, and, uh, and then it was complicated by the pandemic. So a lot of the people we would interview in person and um, stuff. But uh, uh, we wrote it and it was really, really gratifying because, you know, we tried to do what we do in all our books is sort of explore some of the nooks and crannies of the universe that, that, tend to get um, overlooked in other books. Like, for instance, when we did Galactica, you know, I think I wrote the greatest chapter in the history of chapters on Galactica 1980 because mm -hmm. I knew no one else would ever cover it. This would be the last book. <laughs> so, you know what? And it was funny because we wrote our, our the first, we wrote that chapter and I read it back and I'm just like, this isn't good enough. We can mm -hmm. do it better because no one's ever going to cover this show again. And it's like, we have to, we, we owe it to posterity. So I wrote it and it's hysterical. And I love that chapter. I love that whole book, but I love that chapter. So it was the same thing with this, with the holiday special. It's like, we got to really, you know, we can't do the perfunctory coverage of the holiday special. The author, ridiculous. It's awful. Everybody hates it. Life day. Ha. Huh? <laughs> so, you know, we really tried to go and do a deeper dive into why that thing is such a, a, a disaster. And, you know, I think it's a really fascinating story and and you know i think you know this was challenging because more so than any other book there's such a vice-like grip mo mo almost like the empire around this franchise that you know sometimes access can be very challenging mm -hmm. and we weren't used to that because we usually got you know um almost you know 95 percent cooperation and I have to say on this book, it was much more difficult to get people to cooperate. Also, because people are so used to monetizing Star Trek, Star Wars, mm -hmm. that they always have their hand. They, oh, you're not going to pay me for an interview? No, this is a journalist. You know, you're not going to pay. Well, I'm not, you know, I'm not interested. So that was challenging. But at the end of the day, I think we wrote a really great 
book about Star Wars, particularly one that examines the whole franchise in one volume. Because people are going to say, oh, they didn't go into enough detail about this or they didn't do that. I mean, it just wasn't feasible because, it, you know, it's still a very hefty tome. Yeah. And, you know, we, we, we just – it had to be, you know, with very small print uh, and, and uh, you know, but, I mean, we cover it all from the inception through, um, you know, through the Mandalorian. So um, I'm, I'm very, you know, I'm very happy how it came out. I'd really like to do – it's funny. I mean, I keep saying I'm done, but then I'm like, oh, but maybe the next one. <laughs> yeah. I was going to say, um, it sounds like you're dragging yourself back in. more. <laughs> I'd really like to do an oral history of the Clone Wars because I mm. do feel it gets a little bit of short shrift in the book by necessity. And I think there's so much to talk about with the Clone Wars and maybe a book that was Clone Wars, Rebels and Bad Batch. Mm. Um, you know, we'll see. I mean, it depends mm. how this book sells. I, I, I mean, so far – I mean, it was, I was already a bestseller in Kindle. It hasn't even come out yet. So hmm. I'm, I'm somewhat encouraged. Plus, St. Martin's, uh, who published our first book, the, the the Star Trek book, does a really good job marketing and promoting. So I'm yeah. very I'm very optimistic that this book will be a big seller because these guys, we, 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 were, we were very impressed with them on Star Trek. And they didn't do our next couple of books. And and then they're back for this one. And so I'm, I'm very hopeful that, you know, this will be – you know, of, of the success of the Star Trek book, if not more so. I, it's interesting because there's always, uh, uh, over the last eight to 10 years, there's such a hunger for anything Star Wars that comes out. So that certainly, certainly helps you. But it's also, Star Wars is one of the most well-documented from a making of perspective, right? As far as the, yes. the, the, the films, you know, the, the technical aspect and things like that. What are some of the things that you discovered while creating this book that, that surprised you a little bit or that you think people will be most interested in? Yeah, yeah, that's a good question because I do think that there's a lot in here you haven't seen before, but you're absolutely right. I mean, when you have those beautiful uh, Charlie Lippincott coffee table yeah. books, um, how do you compete with that? Those are beautiful uh, books. With you know, he has access to the entire Lucasfilm archives. Mm-hmm. I think what you have are these books that go into that level. You know, with the photos and everything like that, is that they are, you know, products of the myth. So right. they are repeating the myth making, and not that in any way we wanted to dispel the myth or be a gossipy tome. I mean, there have been plenty of books written you know, which were the equivalent of the people versus George hmm. Lucas. Right. Um, and I forget what that book was, you know, about 10, 15 years ago, which was uh, um, really, you know, uh, you know, attempted to just tear the whole thing apart. And obviously, you know, th- there's a lot of questions as to, you know, how important were Gary Kurtz and Marshall Lucas to why Star Wars worked, you know, and, and, and there's a feeling they don't get enough credit. So, I mean, we go into some of that stuff, but it's not about tearing down George Lucas in any way, which a lot of these, you know, non Lucasfilm slash Disney books have done. Right. Um, but I think it is, is about trying to be honest. One of the things I like about the oral histories is you can have multiple opinions and you don't have to side with any one of them. It's like Rashomon. Hmm. So hmm. three people can say three different things and it can be completely contradictory. And it's up to the reader to really say, I believe him or I don't believe them or the truth lies somewhere in between, hmm. which is one of the reasons we really embrace the oral history format. And it's funny because sometimes you have people who say, oh, they're just uh, putting a bunch of quotes together. And, you know, you don't realize <laughs> that, um, you know, you're doing all the research, you're doing all the interviews. You're then creating a structure by which the story is told. I always compare it to like the world's greatest dinner party. <laughs> where you're hanging out with 500 people and you're progressively getting them drunker and drunker through the meal. So they're getting more and more honest and you have to create this narrative, you know, that takes you from the beginning to the end, which is a huge part of writing these books. Right. Um, and that, you know, I discovered the oral history format um, prior to doing the Star Trek book where it was, um, I actually said no a couple of times to doing a Star Trek book. And then I read this book called I want my MTV, which was an mm-hmm. oral history of MTV. And it was really interesting and it was heartfelt and it was funny and it was bawdy and it was all I'm like, this is a great way to tell this story. And then I read right after that live from New York, the Saturday Live Oral History. Mm. And I called my co-writer and I said, I know how you've been trying to get me to do this book on Star Trek. I said, I think I know a way to do it. He said, I thought you don't want to do it. I said, I don't. But if we can do it as an oral history and we can get a good deal for it, that I'd be interested in. And yeah. so of course he used that to go to our agent and said, Okay, Mark's in. You know, if you can get a good deal, like she sold it the next day. Mm. And and then I was like, OK, now I'm stuck writing a book. And then I was <laughs> like, I want to write the best book ever written about Star Trek. 
And I feel like, you know, with the possible exception of Gene Roddenberry and Stephen Whitfield's making of Star Trek, we did. Um, with Star Wars, it, you're right. It was a challenge because there's so many great books about Star Wars. Yeah. I think that this belongs, you know, on the same shelf. But by na the nature of the fact that we're not focusing on any one aspect, because you could do a book of this size just about Star Wars or just yeah. about Empire or just yeah. about the Clone Wars, you know, or just about one of the prequels. I wouldn't write it. But, uh, you know, you could, you, or the sequels or whatever. And, uh, and, and, um, but, um, but, you know, we did it all. And so, um, it was creating a narrative that sort of took you through all of this in a way that was compelling and also wasn't like, oh, this is like the greatest hits or the cliff notes of Star Wars. Yeah. Like, yeah. I, you know, I haven't heard this stuff before. So that's, that's really, you know, what we try to do. And it's like I said, we, the holiday special, you know, certainly the evolution of the Empire Strikes Back scripts and how dramatically that evolved, um, mm. you know, and um, I think, uh, you know, just a lot of stuff that hopefully people haven't, you know, haven't heard before. And, and you know, going into more detail about the prequels and, you know, um, I know a lot of people love those movies and adore those movies. So, you know, we're not putting our opinions into it. It's really right. about letting the creators and the people involved tell this, tell the stories. But I, I think it's also a less, um, you know, again, it's a less Lucasfilm filtered version of the prequels, which right. I think makes it a more interesting story without bashing on them because yeah. we don't. Yeah. I, you know, and I think that you're, you're going to have an, a, another book in, in several years to kind of go back and look at what happened with the sequels. Do you go much into the sequels? Cause there's this, uh, you know, you you see it online. I don't know how how much you, you probably follow all kinds of different fandoms online, but there's this belief that the sequels were a little bit messy in the way that they came together. Do you feel? Do you have? Uh, do you have any insight on the sequels in the book as well? Or yeah, I mean, we obviously we go in a, a lot into um, uh, certainly uh, the duel of the fates situation with Colin. Oh, great! Um, and I think that stuff's you know obviously really interesting. I will say this, it's, it's, um, I think the least successful part of our Star Trek book was when we went to the JJ films, mm -hmm. I think partially because they were too recent. Right. And so you still had people who were towing the party line and less willing to be honest. And, mm -hmm. um, uh, and I think our book, if I be completely honest, suffers a little of that with the sequels, um, yeah. you know, that it's harder to do, you know, even now JJ's first saying, yeah, maybe we should have a plan going yeah. in for all three movies, as though mm -hmm. this is some kind of revelation. <laughs> um, but, you know, look, the, the, those movies are very divisive. I mean, you know, a lot of people absolutely, you know, adored uh, um, Force Awakens and now in retrospect, you know, completely slagging on it and their opinions have, have evolved. Um, you know, I happen to be one of those people who thinks that Last Jedi is, is great um, mm -hmm. uh, with, with caveats. Sure. Uh, you know, with, with with some big caveats. Obviously, the slow motion chase uh, mm -hmm. to hyperspace, um, uh, you know, is is problematic. And then, of course, uh, you know, anything on on Macau, Macau, what what the hell on on um, uh, Canto Bite? Uh, on Canto Bite. Yes. You know, the Canto Bite <laughs> stuff is like another movie, but mm -hmm. it also has some of the great scenes in any Star Wars movie. Cinematography is gorgeous. I'm a big fan of Ryan Johnson. There's a lot I love about it. I also love the message that anyone can, you know, become you know, a, you know, the revolutionary, any, you know, that, you know, this kid who's pushing a broom, I could end up becoming the next, you know, Luke Skywalker. Of course, that was something that never gets followed up on, sure. um, you know, and then rise, rise Skywalker, um, you know, so look, we go into the, we go into these movies and I think in, a, in an interesting way, and people are going to learn a, a lot that probably they didn't know about them, but, you know, it definitely suffers from, this is the last couple of years, I mean, it's, I, I find it with all the books. It's the same thing with Saturday Live. It's like when you get to the the more recent seasons, it's not as interesting without the hi hindsight and without people willing to be um, uh, as candid and as honest. Um, you know, because what you find is like there a lot of the crew um, mm -hmm. is going. You know, it's like Marvel. They're going from movie to movie to movie. So the Star Wars people, they don't want to burn bridges. Right. So you know, they're either not going to talk to you or they're going to give you pre sound bites rather mm -hmm. than their honest uh, honest situation. So that that's always challenging. And that's why I feel like, you know, it's always the older stuff that is is better, you know, is, is better in these books. Um, um, you know, there are exceptions, but uh, but yeah, uh, you know, but we it's it's all in there. 
This is Eric Walker, and you're listening to Around the Galaxy with Pete Fletzer. Talked a little bit before about how and the the phrase we used was was divisive, and the the sequels are are a bit divisive, and the internet has changed the way people talk about films and the way they interact with creators. I mean, for example, uh, I mean, so I, I want to go down a little bit of a road here because you, you ran uh sci-fi universe, which was from what 94 to 97, which was, you know, sort of edgy conversation before the internet, right? I mean, you had, I, I, there was a, a cover, you know, 50 reasons why we hate return of the Jedi, but we love star Wars. Those are the kind of things yeah, you were, yeah. you were, you know, Hey man, you were, you were ahead of your time with that kind of stuff. No, no, we're, look, I, we were, and I, I've talked about this in the past, which is the idea that, you know, the internet didn't exist so, and everything was very kiss ass at the time. Mm -hmm. So we were an antidote for the more anodyne kind of sci-fi magazines, specifically star log and, and a lot of these, you know, kind of things. Um, and, and it, you know, it, it pissed off a lot of people, but we were kind of the infant terribles of that era in, in that we would really, you know, call it like we saw it. The stuff we loved, we would talk about how passionately we loved it. Stuff we didn't, you know, and sometimes it was tough love, like mm -hmm. that 50 years, uh, 50 reasons we hate Return of the Jedi, but love yep. Star Wars. Um, and, um, but, you know, it's interesting because with the internet, I would never do a magazine like that again mm -hmm. because I think the hate you know, hate leads to anger, anger leads to, <laughs> leads to summer. And I think that, you know, I think that when we were the only ones in town, it was important to have a critical voice. But now all that exists yes. is like a critical voice. And most of them don't have the critical acumen to back it up. So, I, you know, I may, you know, now would never do a magazine like that. I, and, and in fact, we make a big point in our Star Trek podcast, in Glorious Trek Experts, um, to only celebrate what we love and we don't mm -hmm. talk about what we hate about Star Trek. Right. You know, we, we really just talk about the things that we really like. And, you know, we leave it to other people because, you know, whatever we dislike is probably somebody's favorite show. Yep. You know, and, yep. and, and maybe the things we love are, are somebody's least favorite shows. But yep. that's, you know, but we're, we're not going to talk about all the negativity. We want to embrace the positive because it's, you know, the Twitter and everything is such a cesspool of mm -hmm. hate, you yep. know, and um you know, and the, and the thing, you know, even the people that didn't like Last Jedi, it got so personal against R Ryan Johnson. You right. know, you read some of the negativity around Kathleen, uh, Kathleen Kennedy. I mean, people forget she produced their childhood. That she's <laughs> responsible for some of the greatest right. movies of all time. And yet, you know, they, 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 you know, everything they dislike about these franchises, they blame her, you know, and, and it's, 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 it's incredibly unfair and it's, it's borderline misogynistic. And, um, you know, it's 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 kind of ridiculous. And I'm like, you can be critical without being spiteful and without being hateful. Mm -hmm. And, you know, because you're entitled to like what you like and not like what you like. But, you know, it's also the whole idea of like, oh, well, you're an ass. You're an idiot. You know, people call it gatekeeping, which I think is bullshit. It's mm -hmm. kind of like I'm like, you can say you hate something, right. but it doesn't mean that the person who likes it is wrong. It's just right. like let them like what they like. And you can argue about it. There was a time where like it was healthy to argue about stuff. Right. You know, it's like. I, when Jedi came out, I mean, I remember it's like there were people who loved it and, you know, people who loved the Ewoks and people didn't like the Ewoks. And you could argue about it and you still – there was no animosity. There was no bitterness about it. That was part of the fun of being a fan, right? you know? You could have different opinions. You know, it's like Logan's Run is great. No, Logan's Run sucks, you know? And <laughs> and now it's so like you have to take sides. It's it's much like how the country has become so polarized. Yeah. It's the same thing in, in fandom. And it's unfortunate because you lose out on – you know, conversations that will potentially elevate the critical discourse. And, you know, it's all or nothing. It's like, you know, we said about Jedi, uh, Last Jedi, you know, how, yeah, the things about it that I think are crazy, ridiculous, and stupid. Right. But overall, I really enjoy the movie for, for so many other reasons. And, yep. and uh, you know, and I could still look at, look at Jedi, I think, is a mess. But there are <laughs> things about it I love, you know, right. like the Emperor and the throne room scene, you know, and, 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 uh, you know, so I could still really enjoy Jedi while not liking certain things. About, sure. You know, about that movie. Well, and that that's a really important thing. And, and you 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 nailed something that I've been trying to to find the right way to say, and you did a great job with it. Is that you can't it, the the ability to have that conversation is now gone. Like for example, I mean, I I run a Star Wars podcast. I've been doing this for a couple of years. I have people who who I engage with regularly. I had real problems with the Rise of Skywalker. Real problems with it. Um but the challenge is 
to talk about it in a critical way is very difficult because immediately people listening to this show right now might say, oh, well, he didn't like last year, uh, Richard Rise Skywalker and shut down, right? But that's, uh-huh. there was there was enough about, there's things that I really enjoyed. I'm with you on Last Jedi. I think it was a brilliantly written, brilliantly shot. I love what it was trying to say, but the exact things that you said were the same things that I had issue with. The problem is that conversation is is now lost in this 280 character world that we live in. Yeah, totally. Where it becomes it, hate, love, hate, love. It's like Robert Mitchum and you know Night of the Hunter. Hate, love, hate. You know, yeah. and it's it's like there's a middle ground. I mean, there's there's a middle ground, and uh, it's just incredible to me that they would have done a trilogy without having a sense of mm-hmm. what the structure the structure would be. But at, at the same time, it, it's got to be incredibly um, daunting you know, to have to follow in the footsteps of those movies. And particularly given the fact that the prequels are all, you know, for the most part, not beloved. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, there is a generation uh, and there is a group that, you know, absolutely adore and think they're the best movies. But so how do you step in and say, okay, we're going to do Star, we're going to go back to the originals and, and, and harken back to that and, you know, bring back everything you loved about Star Wars. You know, was the answer really just retelling Star Wars again after Jedi did the same thing? Probably not, hmm. but um, but unfortunately, you know, it's so daunting, and you're dealing with a company that's very risk averse. You know, right. so how are we going to get the most, make the most people happy and the least people unhappy? Because you see that in Rise of Skywalker too. There's yeah. like this dramatic um, about face because okay, we don't want the people that hated Jedi to hate this uh, uh, last Jedi, so we're going to try and you know rectify all that stuff and just give them everything they love about star wars Mm. and you know obviously that wasn't completely successful in that sense but you know then look at something like you know people i mean look i'm a huge fan of rogue one so Mm -hmm. i I mean rogue one to me is up there with my favorite star wars movies and and like that's something they completely get right which sometimes gets falls out of the conversation because everybody's too busy bashing on all the sequels (laughs) they forget that rogue one is you know a terrific movie and and it's a heist movie and it's interesting characters and it's an ensemble and that's why star wars worked in the first place so i I think surprises you it kills off you know, I was shocking when Obi Wan got killed, right? Star Wars when you saw the first they right. kill off most of the principal cast. Yeah, I mean that's gutsy. Yeah, and I, I, you know, and then at the time, you know, Disney isn't happy because it didn't do Force Awakens business, and the toy line wasn't successful, which should have come as a shock to no one. Because mm-hmm. how is a kid going to play with characters they saw die in the movie? <laughs> right. You know, yeah. um, you know how are you going to have your continuing adventures as a seven year old if you know they're dead? Mm-hmm. Um, you're not going to do the prequel, so. Um, you know, it's it's um, you know they should be thrilled because they they actually made a really good movie that will stand the test of time. Yeah. That is a true Star Wars prequel in a beautiful way, and um, it's just so um, I don't know, it's 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 so bizarre. But I'm so fascinated by all these TV shows now. I mean, I'm really looking forward to Andor. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I'm 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 excited to see what they do. You know, Mandalorian is it's 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 I I've, I've joked about this. I said it's what Six Million Dollar Man was to me as a kid. Hmm. Six Million Dollar Man. You know, twenty years from now, I'm not you know I thirty years. I don't look back and say wow, that was a great show. But when I was a certain age, that was like the greatest show in the world. Super yep. fun. Mm-hmm. And Mandalorian is like it's super fun. Is it deep? No. Is it you know <laughs> is it is redefining TV on a technical level? Yeah, but on a story level, not really. But it's super fun. Right. I enjoy watching it. Right. You know, that's a nice bar. You know, the fact that it's enjoy because so much of TV is so complex and dark and, you know, trying to reinvent the wheel and, you know, and, and, and be socially, um, you know, t- you know and, and, and I just want um, a show that, uh, you know, that can entertain me for 45 minutes, which yeah. it does marvelously. We are so lucky. I mean, you know what it was like to grow up. You know, after Jedi, like thinking it's yeah. all over, right? Yeah. I mean, it was like all we had was nothing, and then we get Shadows <laughs> of the Empire. We we get into you know Prince Caesar. I was like, okay, a book and a, and a CD and a bunch of action figures is not a Star Wars movie. Right, now right. we have just nothing but Star Wars, and people are so, you know, oh, this all this Star Wars stuff sucks. But mm. you know, it's like this is horrible, and it's like, but you know, it doesn't have to be for everybody, like. Bad Batch, certain people probably don't like it, yeah. you know, but it's not, maybe it's not for you. Maybe it's not for them, you know, but yeah. it's, uh, I, I just, I don't get the lack of, uh, you know, 
it's it's frustrating to me uh, because and i've said it before and i it's the the argument i go to all the time is you know it, i might have a favorite band and i might have loved their first five albums and their sixth album is not what i love but it's that same kind of concept and i think what's also might be an issue too and we talked to, about the internet and is people want to pull more from these than maybe uh, I think Star Wars is, is working at multiple levels right now, but trying to do so may be where it's challenges. You can have your fun Rogue One. You can have your fun, fun Rogue One. Seven people get killed at the end of it, but, <laughs> but um, yeah. you can have your Mandalorian, which is, as, as you said, is it brain surgery? No, but is it the most fun you can have once a week? Absolutely. It's a, it's a great show. But once you start to dig into and go to those next levels, that's where the arguments tend to happen because that's not the way I imagine Luke Skywalker would go, or that's not the way this would, would happen. Do you think that the internet discourse from a different perspective is making it more difficult for creators? So for example, Sonic the Hedgehog, right? There was all the, the outcry about the way he looked just this past weekend. There were some, some morons who were going after James Mangold about Indiana Jones five, which just literally started shooting. Yeah, is this, I, I think, I think it is harder, and I'll tell you why. But first, I want to address. You made a great analogy with, you know, uh, the, your band analogy because I would say the the problem is after a couple of albums, mm -hmm. all you know, you go see them in concert. All you want to hear is the greatest hits. Right. So it's like mm -hmm. you know, it's like oh, their their later albums suck. So you just want to hear greatest, hits. <laughs> and that's what Disney did. You know, the Force Awakens is the greatest hits album, yep. and it was like oh, you know, I kind of miss hearing something new. I've heard all these songs, and I kind of want something new. So let you know. Then they give you something new, and you're like, "Oh, I don't like this album. It, 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 I, I want to hear it. it's too. It's too different. Yep. You know. Oh, Luke, Luke is. You know, Luke is bitter, and 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 he's given up the fight, and mm -hmm. you know all this stuff. And it's like, oh, that's not how Luke would be. We want to see him like he is <laughs> in the greatest hits. You know, we want to see him in Jedi with the green lightsaber kicking ass. You know, we, we saw that movie. Yep. You know, <laughs> yep. and, and and so it's it's really interesting because uh, you can't please everyone. Yeah. And what happens is it's not the creators that have the problem. It's the studio. And then mm -hmm. the studio wants to please everybody. And they, they're so worried that Twitter can kill a movie the first weekend. Mm -hmm. So then they're leaning on the creators to make sure that they do, don't think too outside the box. And it le leads to really anodyne storytelling because then the studio is really, because I mean, I heard a rumor and I don't know if it's true that early on Disney had really been pushing JJ to include Darth Vader in um uh in force awakens and he's mm -hmm. like you do realize darth vader died at the end of jedi <laughs> right you know like we'll just get him in so he comes up with kylo ren to be the darth vader stand-in but mm -hmm. you know then you know it's crazy because rogue one you know is great super original movie but what's the thing everybody remembers and loves and i'm not knocking it because it's awesome it's vader <laughs> at the end you know yep. so you know there is some truth to that you know but it's like we have to create new characters that are just as cool as Darth Vader. They're just as cool as Boba Fett. They're just, mm. as, you know, cool as Luke Skywalker, or, you know. So and, and that's the challenge. And sometimes the audience needs time to fall in love with these characters. I mean, you know, it's so funny. Star Wars made the same mistake that Star, Star Trek did. Because when Star Trek passed the baton from um, the original cast to the next gen, they said, we really want to focus on the next gen and not do too much with the original. So they just had Shatner in a you know, medium-sized role, and they barely had the rest of the cast, and Leonard and Dee passed because you know there was nothing for them to do. Had that been a full Next Generation original series, Avengers, mm -hmm. that movie would have been huge, and people right. would have loved it. Same thing with Star Wars. Well, we don't want too much of Harrison and too much of Mark and too much of – because we really want to introduce these new characters. Mm -hmm. Well, you know what? If you're going to have them, use them, and then right. have them leave the stage. But you know that's what so I think kills people. You have a movie mm -hmm. where Mark Hamill doesn't show up until his hand shows up at the very end of the movie, <laughs> yep. and, and you know, and then you, you you have Harrison Harrison Ford finally come back, one of the most beloved characters of all time, to play Han Solo. And what do you do? You know, you have his son kill him, and he falls off a bridge for no good reason. Right. It's not even like you know, a Jedi when he wanted to die, he wanted to die heroically, like saving the universe, flying right. the Millennium Falcon into the Death Star. In, in, in Force Awakens, he literally goes back and stands on a bridge and gets killed by his right. own son. I mean, so it, it's, it's like there's nothing redeeming about that death. It's like, so that leaves such a bad taste in, in people's mouths, I think. This is Scott Chernoff, and you're listening to Around the Galaxy with Pete. A lot of people do say 
and I've tended to disagree, but you brought up an interesting point that Disney is the reason why Star Wars is not what it was, right? And I'm not going to say better or worse because I actually I love so much of what's out there right now. Um, is it because Disney is 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 looking at it from that big studio perspective? Is it putting undue pressure or different pressure uh, on on the creators to make sure they're they're creating something that that is sellable? And does that have that no, impact? I, I think it would be true at any studio. I think mm-hmm. it's unfair to to label you know that on on Disney they're trying to appeal to the widest possible audience. And that would be true of any studio. I think you know people are saying, "Oh, what would Lucas do?" Well, we know what Lucas did. He did the, he did the prequels. And you know the the thing the the thing with Lucas is, um, obviously he would be using his own money had he not sold. So right. he also is going to want to do it for as little money as possible to spend mm-hmm. as little money possible. And um, you know it's very hard because you know you hear what his plans were for the final trilogy with Metacolorians and mm-hmm. you know the and it's just. Would that have been any better? I don't know. Right. Well, the, I think you the know. same people who were the people versus George Lucas would have ripped that apart, right? So there it was it it was kind of a no-win and as you said it's it's so much of childhood. There's so many intangibles that go mm-hmm. into it. It makes it, it honestly and and I've said this before and I'll stick with it. Nothing would have made everybody happy. It's impossible. No, it's impossible. It's absolutely impossible. You know, yeah. people are looking for different stuff. And you're absolutely right. There's a certain audience that is looking for nostalgia. And they want to see as much of Han, Leah, and, 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 and Luke as they can. And R2, and R who was, like, missing in action yeah. for the most part. And yeah. then you have a whole new audience who says, I don't want to see those old fogies. Yep. You know, I want to see the sexy young characters. Mm-hmm. And so it's like, how do you – you know, this what's great about the TV shows. It's like they're making TV shows for everybody. And yeah. somehow with Mandalorian, they seem to hit the sweet spot where it seems like virtually everyone loves it. You know, but they're going to make shows that are going to work for people like, you know, Andor and Obi-Wan. And, and, and you know, some people are probably not going to like them. Yep. But that's OK, because every couple of weeks it's going to be a new show. <laughs> right. So, right. Who would have thought? Oh, oh my gosh. Yeah, forget, you can imagine if they told, you know, 10 year old you and I that when you're older, there's going to be Star Wars. All the time. <laughs> like, am I going to be dead? Is that happen? Right. Is that what happened? Like? You know, it's like, I mean, it's crazy. I mean, somebody told me there would be whatever it is, 12, 13 Star Trek movies. And, right. uh, and, and, and God knows how many shows and all these and Star Wars TV shows. And, and they were going to bring back Battlestar Galactica. Right. I'd be like, you're on glue. You know, it's, <laughs> you know, it's not not po- it's not at all possible. So yeah, it's it's, cra- it's crazy, but it's good. It gives us something to talk about, you know. At the end of the day, and and uh, you know, Star Star Wars, you know, Star Wars isn't going anywhere. And um, you know, I think that uh, the next couple of years will be interesting because it, you know they they clearly know what they're doing when it comes to TV. It'll be interesting to see if they get the movies back on track. It'll be right. very interesting in the wake of. So the the critical bashing that uh, Wonder Woman eighty four got, mm. you know, is this Patty Jenkins film actually going to happen? Is the Takia Waititi film going to happen? Mm. You know, what's Kevin Feige got up his sleeve? You know, it's you know it, they got to do something with these movies. I mean, they've had a couple of swings and misses. You know, first with the the Game of Thrones guys, and then obviously it doesn't seem like this Ryan Johnson thing is happening. That it's quietly going away. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know that for sure, but it just seems like been all quiet on the western front there and you know when he's getting this kind of deal at netflix to do knives out for hundreds of millions of dollars yeah. it's like why would he do star wars why would he put him through that i'll do, he says i'll get critical love i'll make yeah. a ton of money and i don't have to answer to anybody why <laughs> would he go work for disney to, to get nothing but bashing for 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 from the fans i mean you know he he did he, he got to make a star wars movie why even bother you know i don't blame yeah. him yeah. um so no, it's a, uh, it's a, it's a, it's a great point, and it's interesting. And and uh, the, the last question I'll ask you is is where you were headed there is, you know, is Star Wars? I mean, because you have great insight into all kinds of all the the major franchises from from your oral histories and and just from being in the business for as long as you have, is the Star Wars drama around directors and writers and and the, and and all all the things that that gets publicized and picked up, is that the norm, but we just never hear about it. Or is Star Wars a little bit more of a dramatic job to take? As a uh, look, it's true of any big franchise. I mean, I think Star Star Wars is more in the microscope. 
Mm-hmm. And it does happen a little bit more. I mean, obviously the change is on Solo. And then, you know, I I, def- I definitely think, you know, Jedi, last Jedi spooked them. They tried to do something a little different and they got hammered. And I think they also, you know, they were expecting all these movies to do Force Awakens numbers. And when mm-hmm. they didn't, you know, they really, um, it, it, you know, it's, it's, it scared them. Mm-hmm. And so they ran around like, you know, trying to, you know, put Humpty Bump Dumpty back together and you, you get as a result, you get, you know, what happened with Solo, which I know, you know, a lot of people like and it's fun, but, you know, it's a glorified TV movie, an entertaining mm-hmm. one, but, um, but it's, it's, uh, I think, it's, I think it's, it's, it's really, it's really challenging um, for them, but I, I, you know, and, and in retrospect, you kind of think, well, maybe Solo with those guys it would have been interesting to see what they would have done with it. You know, it would have been it would have been different. And the Star Wars universe is elastic enough. It's just maybe that was the wrong movie for them. Maybe the solo prequel wasn't the right thing to do a tonal shift, Mm. you know, because that we know what Han Solo is. We know what Lando is. We know what we expect to see in a prequel. So if you're going to give Miller and Lord a chance to work in the Star Wars universe, maybe it should be about a bounty hunter or maybe it should be about the underworld or maybe it should be something that we don't have this kind of deep emotional investment and sense of what exactly it's going to be. Right. And then, you know, Colin getting the boot, um, you know, I think in retrospect, after everything we've seen about duel of the fates, it's kind of like, wow, it's kind of disappointing because it, it seems like that could have been really interesting. Yeah. And at least it would have been something we hadn't seen. And it seemed like he really got star Wars and, um, you know, and it was surprising because, of course, you know, JJ and and, and Ka- Catherine, Catherine Kennedy didn't, you know, really see eye, eye to eye for a lot of the Force Awakens production. So it's kind of surprising that they came back to JJ. But you know, there is it's like hiring, you know, you hire people in this business because they can get the job done. And there are a lot of people, you know, if you haven't proven you can get it done, it's hard to get hired. That's the secret of the business. Once you've done it once. People want to hire you again because they know you can do it, and it's not something that everyone can do. Whether it's a showrunner or a director of a big studio movie, and um, so JJ, they knew, you know, when they, you know, they only had a little bit of time. They knew he could get it done, mm-hmm. and they knew he could get it done at a certain level of quality. You know, he could he could develop the script in the time they needed. He could make the movie. He, you know, they knew what they were getting. It was a known quantity, and. Um, and so it's risky when you go with someone who hasn't done it before, mm. um, because at the end of the day, this is a, it's a business. I mean, it's yeah. why John Favreau gets hired to do Mandalorian. It was a risk that paid off, but you know he did Jungle Book. He did, um, you know, be, be um, um, jo- well, Lion King. Lion King. So he yeah. knew how to mm-hmm. work with this technology, and and so it made sense. Had John Favreau not done those movies, there's no way John Favreau gets hired to right. do uh, Mandalorian. You know, so it's it's like people want to mitigate risk. People are very risk averse because people who take on risk, they can be the hero or they can get fired. Mm-hmm. And chances are, you know, when you take a risk in this business, more likely you're going to be the one who gets fired than has mm-hmm. that one in a million success. So um, people don't want to take risks. And so you hire people that you know have done it before or done something similar and can get it done. But as a result, you know, sometimes things aren't imaginative. I mean, look at Star Wars is a perfect lesson. Mm. Here's a guy who has this huge hit, and he wants to do something nobody believes in. Nobody understands the script for Star Wars. Nobody mm. thinks it's going to make a dime. But ultimately, Alan, one guy is willing to take the risk. Alan Land is willing to take the risk only because you know he trusts. You know, he did this one film that was super successful. That he goes, okay, well, if he could do American Graffiti, then I guess whatever this is, <laughs> maybe it'll work. And even then, the board of directors is breathing down his neck, and he has to cut the budget. And the whole time, they want to cancel it. And they and they pull the plug on it before he's wrapped, and he has to sneak back and finish the movie. So even then, in the 70s, so when we say, oh, Disney, you know, the new age of bean counters, it's always been that right. way. Sure, yep. Yeah, yeah that's <laughs> and I think people need to remember that, right? At the end of the well, day, yeah, and, and, if, and if Star Wars doesn't make money you know what we don't get more star wars we don't get to live in this this time of of an embarrassment of riches when it comes to it's the golden age of star wars. i don't think waiting every, three years for every we you know we got lucky on empire but like i i, I you know, if i my difference of, of like waiting three weeks to see a new star wars tv series and a you know year between movies or 
uh, waiting three years for every new Star Wars movie? I'll take now. Sure. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. In a heartbeat, without even thinking about it. So people don't realize what that was like. Three freaking years between yeah. movies. I mean, you know, it's one thing, you know, you you're waiting and you're trying to figure out what Empire is going to be about and who Darth Vader is and what Obi Wan did, you know, and the dad and all this stuff. And then it blows your mind because, you know, of course, back then, no spoilers. Right. So it's like, and it blows your your mind. And then you wait three years for Jedi, and it's like, oh, he's their sister and brother. Oh, Darth Vader turns good. Hmm. Oh, you know, the teddy bear saved them. It's like, I know it's three years waiting for that. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. I'd rather, right. If you're not going to love it, I'd rather move on to the next thing more quickly. Uh, exactly. and, and and on the other side, if you do love it, you get it so much quicker and better. And and so it is, a, it's an amazing time. So Mark, thank you so much for hanging out with us. Today. This was, this was fantastic. Where can people uh, find you and, and, uh, and where can we get the book? Well, Pete, thank you for asking. First, I want to say I'm um, still uh, two more weeks on the Kickstarter for 1982 Greatest oh, right. Ever. Yes. So yep. if people want to support that, they should go to Kickstarter. We're, we're uh, doing a deep dive uh, for, for the 40th anniversary next year. So we'll be covering Star Trek II, and we're going to be covering um, um, uh, Poltergeist and, and E.T. and Blade Runner and all these amazing movies. And, of course, obscure stuff like um, – you know, Forbidden World and Time Rider and Megaforce and Swamp Thing. It's going to be amazing. So they should go to Kickstarter and check out 1982 Greatest Geek Year Ever. The book comes out next month. You can pre-order it wherever you get your books, uh, Amazon or Barnes & Noble. Um, it's going to be in hardcover, audiobook, and, uh, and uh, you know, digital Kindle as well. And, um, uh, you know, I hope people will check that out. I hope they enjoy it. And if they want to follow me on social media, they can go to at Mark A. Altman. Or if they want to follow our podcast, in, at Inglorious Trek. And I'm on Instagram and on um, on Twitter. Awesome. I'll put all those links in the show notes. And uh, Mark, thank you so much. This was a blast. And I, I hope I get to catch up with you again sometime. Well, do I qualify as somebody who knows about Star Wars or are you still going to think? Oh, no. I you you know, I, I, I almost feel like you know more about Star Wars than Star Trek. Now, I don't know if I go that far, but you are definitely you're definitely a Star Wars guy now yeah. in my eyes as well. So. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that wraps it up for this episode of Around the Galaxy. If you had fun, please like, subscribe, share, and review it. If you really had fun and would like to be part of the live virtual audience, please check out our Patreon page at patreon.com slash ATGCast. Make sure to follow us on Twitter or all your social media at ATGCast and go to our website, ATGCast.com, for more information about the show, merch, and all kinds of great links. Around the Galaxy is copyright 2021 Pete and the Seed Studios, and our music is by the band Silver Colored Knob, which can be found wherever you find music. 